Hello and welcome to another episode of Speed Speak. My name is Sonia Begeman. I'm the editorial director here at Speed World Group. I'm excited because today we are tackling a hot topic. We're talking pesticides and agriculture. What are consumer perspectives? What are farmers thinking? And, and what are the questions that we need to have answered uh, pertaining to their use as it relates to sustainability, safety, and other concerns we've heard? I'm very excited because we have three great guests joining us today. We have John Jameson. He is the president and CEO of the Canada Center for Food Integrity. Fred Whitford, he is the coordinator of Produce Pesticide Programs. And joining us uh, by audio today is Aaron Hager, associate professor and universe at the University of Illinois Extension. Uh, he's also a lead scientist there. So thank you guys so much for joining me today. I think this is going to be a great topic. Um, I'm going to just dive right in because I think we're going to have a lot of uh, really interesting questions and great feedback from our audience today. That said, audience, if you have questions, please enter them um, here on Facebook or on YouTube, wherever you're at. Let us know what you'd like to, to ask these great experts. So, John, you are with the Center uh, Canada Center for Food Integrity. You work with consumers a lot. So with the surveys that you've been doing, and I know you've done a lot of research here recently, Give us a quick overview of what consumers' perspectives are concerning pesticides. Is it all negative or is there some positive there? Uh, no, certainly some positive, Sonia. And, and just as a bit of background, uh, Canadian Centre for Food Integrity has been surveying Canadian consumers since our inception in 2016 about their attitudes around the food system. And we asked a variety of questions around pesticide use, GMOs, hormones, antibiotics. What we are seeing in the, in the thoughts of Canadians around pesticide use is a bit of softening of the concern, which is a good thing. So, for example, in 2017 to the present, we've seen a 10-point drop in the number of people who rate uh, a high level of concern with the use of pesticide, pesticides in food production. That's a good thing. And I think it speaks to the industry's ability to... Um, better connect with the consumer. The bad news in the, in the numbers at that is that there's still a significant number of people who have uh, moderate to high concern around the use of pesticides. And often it's, you know, pesticide itself is a scary word and they don't know a lot about modern food production and, and that is shaping their, their thoughts along with some of the media attention they're hearing um, in social media and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, you know, safety, talking about safety. I read a recent report by FDA talking about, you know, pesticides in food and, you know, almost 99% of foods have, you know, well within what, what USDA considers an acceptable amount of residue and almost 50% of those have no residue at all. And so to think about, you know, what we're actually seeing in the food and, and, you know, those potential safety concerns, it's such a low number and USDA, or USDA, I'm sorry, FDA, of course, their tolerance ratings are so protective. Really, it would take like 100 times in some cases mm -hmm. more of what they're actually finding to actually cause any damage. So um, the safety is there. I think there's some messaging that obviously needs to happen for sure. So, um, so but if you think about what, what John was saying and, he, and you said it, that means you would have to understand tolerances and you would have to understand you're telling people it's okay to eat pesticides. And... That's, I, I don't know what else to say. It, that's, that's a hard concept for many people to uh, appreciate that we do have the science, and it is science-based, uh, but just the concept itself is, is something that's difficult and not palatable to lots of people. Yeah, I, I totally can understand that. It's the idea of, you know, I, I don't want any of it in there, even if it is acceptable. So it is a difficult sure. conversation to have for sure, yeah. for sure. Well, Aaron, I'm going to shift gears here for a minute, and we're going to talk about weeds, weeds and herbicides. And so, you know, when we look at what's going on right now in the world of weeds, we have a lot of resistance. Um, weeds are evolving to withstand herbicides in a way that is is pretty challenging for farmers. Um, when we look at the formulations and the, the the chemistries that farmers are using today in fields, how does that compare to the chemistries that we saw? 50 years ago? The chemistries have really changed over time in a lot of respects. You know, when I was a kid growing up on a farm over in West Central Illinois, we were using products that maybe, 
you know, two to four quarts per acre, for example, but now you have products that are even applied at fractions of an ounce per acre. So the actual use rate of many products has, has dramatically lower compared with what it was, say, 40 or 50 years ago. And a lot of the other profiles of, of the herbicides, whether they be toxicity to mammalian systems or ecological toxicity concerns, are in general much better, much more improved with today's list of herbicides that farmers have to select from compared with where they were years and years ago. But you're right, the, the continued evolution of weed species that are resistant to herbicides is, is a continuing challenge and will be in the foreseeable future. As a matter of fact, uh, just earlier today uh, in, a, in a statement, we, and as well as Dr. Larry Steckel at the University of Tennessee announced dicamba resistant water hemp has been found in, in both Illinois and Tennessee. So the evolution of resistance is something that's gonna continue in the foreseeable future and certainly uh, we believe that many farmers will continue to use herbicides to try to manage weed species, but certainly the evolution, the continued evolution of resistance highlights the need for other practices in addition to using herbicides to try to control weeds and ensure at the end of the year that there's very little, if any, weed seed that's returned to the seed banks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's an ongoing challenge for sure and, and speaks to uh, continued innovation, continued uh, looking into practices, I'm sure, like uh, mechanical things and things like that. And we can we can talk more about that later, too, Aaron. Um, I do want to shift to kind of talking about maybe insects and even and f fungus even with you, Fred. So, um, you know, when we look at broad acre row crops like corn, I'll, I'll use that as a great example. Um, BT traits were huge. They, they helped reduce pesticide use because it was obviously found within the plant and it protected the plant that way. Um, but as we were seeing with weeds, we're seeing something similar in, in those BT traits that those pests are, are developing that resistance to the BT trait. Um, so how, how does the, I guess, reduction of, uh, or the, the tolerances of those insects, uh, impact the pesticide use in the United States? Does it make pesticides more important to farmers? Does it make it to where we might see more pesticides used? And, and, and the answer is yes, but it's always the easy answer. So, it, you know, a lot of these traits that, that, we, that we use are preventative in nature. That is, I'm an old corn borer guy, and you'd have to be pretty old to remember corn borers. But I did all my work on corn borers. And so, you know, th in that particular case, you could never really do a good job scouting the second generation. We were losing yield because we couldn't get out there. And so a lot of the things that we do today is to try to hit these, these big groups of insects. And so whether that seed treatment or the BT track of the BT type traits or traits in general, uh, they're <coughs> extremely important. And it's not so much maybe in reducing pesticide use, though it could, it's important that it allows us opportunities to take certain things out that we're having trouble uh, that that's impacting our yields. So, you know, if we got rid of the BT traits, uh, then, then obviously, uh, as, as Aaron was talking about, we would have to readjust how we do things. But resistance is going to be a problem, no matter if it's weeds, insects or diseases, when we continue to rely on the same types of products. And that's just no difference in medications. There's, there's, you know, it's, it's, these are mother nature that we're trying to fight with and she normally wins at the ultimately and then we have to then sort of change our tactics and our approach to to use what we have available to our advantage so in my world it's crop rotation i think uh, aaron would mention the same thing that if we could get people to rotate if we have those those traits rotate your traits rotate rotate to try to be able to basically to try to soften that resistance, but they're extremely important traits that we have and that allow us to, to, to be more productive. Absolutely. And I'm going to shift gears back to kind of the consumer facing questions here. Betsy Danielson, uh, one of our audience members, asked a really good question and she called me on something. I'm glad she did. It's the idea of we should be talking about risk versus safety. And I think that's a really good point. And so I think first, um, I'll, I'll point to you, John, you know, why should we be talking maybe about risk instead of safety when it comes to pesticides when we're talking to those consumers? Well, I think, you know, it, it, it's a tough issue, but I think it's, um, 
you know, the average person understands risk and it may, it may resonate more closely with, with the consumer than, than talking about the safety. And Fred alluded to this, that when we start talking about the safety of pesticides and we're talking about, uh, you know, the, the regulatory system that they go through for approvals and the like, it's, it, it's difficult to get that message across in the 30 second soundbite because many people don't have a very good knowledge of how our food is produced. They're, they're quite a bit distance from the, uh, from the farm than, than previous generations. Um, they struggle with the science. And again, it doesn't lend itself very easily, but also there's a significant amount of misinformation out there that the industry has to um, respond to. One of the things that I think, you know, rather than speaking risk or safety, is that um, we may need to think about how we can get our message across through some verifiable uh, third party credible sources. And uh, because often what we're seeing is that the, the consumer has what we call information chaos. So they're not really sure what information they're reading is accurate and it's correct. So if we're able to find some third party verifiers that, that speak on behalf of the whole food system or, or don't have an ax to grind uh, as an industry association or a company, that may actually resonate better with the, with the consumer on the whole. Mm -hmm. Now, Fred, uh, the Purdue pesticide programs, I know, you know, you're working with all kinds of people. Um, yeah. You know, what, what would your response be, you know, talking about maybe a risk adverse or, or instead of just safety? I think collectively as, as industries and universities, we have failed to make that challenge. We try to walk away from it. We don't want to make people mad. So what I do is I just tell them how this is my opinion. You can have your own opinion. I'm fine. You can do whatever you want, but this is how we do things. Yes, we do the testing. Yes. And so I explain the, the system. And but then I try to go back and give examples. Um, and this goes back to because uh, of some like Aaron and, and his work with weeds. You know, we, we can control weeds, Aaron, without chemicals. But that's going to require some steel. You want me to go back to steel and people say, well, sure. Uh, that's a good thing. That would be a whole lot better for the environment. Then I say, okay, well, then we're going to have soil erosion. We're going to lose the soil that's going to feed the future. It's going to fill the creeks up. We're going to hurt wildlife. And we can do that. But for everything that we do, there's a trade-off, and there's always something that comes with it. So I think uh, for me uh, personally, it's standing up in front of a group and not being timid about it and saying, this is my belief. You can differ, and I'm fine with that. I don't it's okay, but we, we need to address these issues head on without trying to hide with smoking mirrors, in my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And Aaron, you talked, you know, just a, a moment ago about the difference in what the chemistries are today, the risk we had 50 years ago versus what we're seeing today. Is there anything that you would add just to this, to this idea here of risk versus safety? I think a lot of the public concern just really emanates from the fact that the, the system that's in place in the United States that regulates pesticides is, is gen, I would say in general, poorly understood by the, by the public at large. You know, before any pesticide is even advanced through the registration process, there's what's called a risk assessment. And only if using that product in a, in a way according to what the label would suggest the use pattern should be, if the risks are deemed too high, that product is never advanced. So there's never a tolerance established for it. So the EPA is evaluating the risk of these things well in advance of establishing the tolerances that you mentioned earlier in the food supply. And you know, the other thing that I think sometimes folks may have a little bit of trouble comprehending or understanding is when they see, you know, the, the numbers for, for, for example, of what are these residue levels? You know, analytical techniques now easily in the parts per billion and, you know, I guess an example that I would give, you know, one, one part per billion. Well, what is, you know, how do you get your mind wrapped around that? Well, one part per billion would be equivalent to one second in 32 years. Okay, so that's what some of these numbers mean. So I really encourage folks to try to better understand, you know, how the regulatory system operates. And then, you know, what scale are we actually talking about when we're talking about pesticides and pesticide residues? Mm-hmm. 
Well, Aaron, that brings me to another question that I think both you and Fred especially will have uh, an opinion on. And John, I think you might too. So we'll, we'll see anyway. Um, and, and you mentioned EPA and you mentioned our regulatory system. Um, and I, I want to just talk about, you know, when we look at activist groups, we look at concerned citizens who um, we've seen it happen in the past um, with what's going on with like the Roundup lawsuits, for example, or we've seen it with chlorpyrifos and atrazine and pyrethroids. And I mean, you name it, uh, dicamba a couple of years ago. Um, these activist groups are suing the EPA for decisions to allow these products through our regulatory system. And my question for you guys is when we see these activist groups, when we see these consumer groups suing a government organization, agency like that, um, or, you know, just really pushing against even allowing these that have been through the testing process, have been through this, what do you think this is going to do for the future of farmer and, and industry access to some of these chemistries that are used um, in, in row crop operations or in vegetable operations? Is it going to, are we going to see, are we going to see more products getting pulled? Are we going to see fewer products coming to market? You know, what do you guys expect to see with this? Aaron, I'll let you go first so I can see how, how you would respond. <laughs> well, <clears throat> we've actually seen a, a tremendous drop in, in the herbicide arena in the last 15 to 20 years in terms of the new active ingredients that do come into the marketplace. What, what we tend to see now are more introductions of products that had previous registrations as compared with actually new active ingredients that have not been used previously. And there's many reasons for this. Of course, there's been a lot of consolidation in the industry over time, and that even continues. Uh, we've had recent consolidation within the last two or three years where two large independent uh, companies have become one now. And so there's fewer companies now who are involved in the primary screening or synthesis of new pesticide active ingredients. The other course would be the cost of bringing these products to the marketplace. You know, you're looking at somewhere around probably conservative estimates of about 300 million to 400 million dollars before a product that was synthesized in a chemist lab actually makes it into the marketplace. So that's a tremendous amount of investment that a company has to make. And the process between discovery and commercialization on average is probably about 10 years. And so if you put yourself in the position of a person in a company who is making a decision, well, are we going to invest $400 million in this? You know, you have to understand that there's going to be a substantial investment of that money before you really ever have a good idea of whether or not that product will ever make it through the evaluation of the US EPA. The US EPA evaluation is very stringent and there's really no guarantees when you submit your, your packet to the EPA that they will approve that product. So there's a large amount of risk. Will there be new products in the marketplace? There certainly will be. But I think the ones that do come into the marketplace in the future are going to be ones that have a very, very clean profile in terms of environmental toxicity as well as toxicity to, to non-plant or non-fungal systems. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I would add that EPA really represents, and then John, this is more along your line of work, that e EPA reflects the, the it reflects what what people desire basically and so it's a good thing sometimes and it, it doesn't seem to make sense but it, when these industry groups when these groups attack a particular product uh, EPA will fight it they always have they, they've been sued ever since they've been in existence the good news it brings new topics to the floor that we can uh, discuss a uh, hormone mimics was one uh, estrogen mimics and you think about my 30 something years in this business um, it, it they're challenged on data and so the, at least from the working people at EPA not the political uh, uh, people at the top but from the scientists at EPA then they're forced to look at a number of different things to see if we can get products that are cleaner as 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 Aaron was talking about so you know, I, I just see this is just a continuation and that industry, uh, whether it's uh, insecticide, herbicides, fungicide, rat baits that make a difference, that it, it's just a challenge for them to discover, if they can, better, cleaner, safer products to be able to get it through EPA in a quicker fashion. So, it, it, you know, it's just the, the times that we're that we're in. 
And John, I think it's Health Canada uh, up north, isn't it, that, that we have to go through with comment periods and things like that. So, I mean, what would you add? Like, what are the concerns that you're hearing during these comment periods about various pesticides? Well, I think Fred's right. It, it, the industry, the pesticide industry and the ag industry on whole is on a, pro, a path of progress. And I always say that the consumer expects progress. They don't expect perfection. And uh, in Canada, it's PMRA that, that regulates uh, pesticide approvals. And, and it does force the industry and, and government to look at itself and, and do a better job. Uh, what we do see in Canada is a very healthy respect for our regulatory system. So when, when our regulatory system responds to some of the, the uh, court cases and the like, um, that that's probably a good thing because people do re respect that, uh, that system, we, at least that we have here in Canada. And I, I expect the numbers are very similar uh, in, in the U.S. The other thing that I do get concerned of, because I, I worked as a senior official in, in uh, government prior to coming to work with the Canadian Center for Food Integrity, is how we could end up with a politicization of pesticides and that there may be decisions made by elected officials or the, the, the upper tier uh, in our regulatory system that may not necessarily be based in science. And we've seen that around the world that uh, that, that that has happened. That is a real fear. And it's actually the probably the the uh, uh, the goal that the activist organizations are aiming for rather than, you know, an improvement in the product. They're probably hoping for some kind of a a response from from uh, politicians and regulators that that more is in line with what what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. A couple of weeks ago, I had a conversation about the farm to fork strategy in mm -hmm. Europe, and you talk about uh, politicizing pesticides. They're they're looking at a fifty percent reduction mm -hmm. in overall pesticide use in agriculture, and that's that's going to be really challenging for those farmers. It's going to be challenging for companies, and I think that was a, a very very well timed uh, and a very good point to make, John. But it, it's also something that we need to keep an eye on because typically, uh, you know, things will start in Europe, they'll migrate to the US and Canada shortly after. So, as an industry, we need to be cognizant of, of what's happening in Europe. And that politicization of pesticides and other uh, modern tools that help us produce safe, wholesome food. Is, is a real threat to uh, food security and food affordability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that leads really well into a question I have for, for all three of you. And that is, you know, um, talking big picture about pesticides here, are pesticides part of the equation when it comes to creating a more sustainable food system? And, and second to that, are they part of the equation when it comes to creating a more stable food supply around the, around the world? And my answer would be yes, yes, and yes. Uh, that I don't have the tools now to replace some of those those particular products. And, and obviously, the researchers are looking at that. What can we do better? What can we do? Because obviously, if a farmer didn't have to use it, there would be more money in their pocket, right? Um, if we didn't need to use seed treatments, why would we have, uh, we would put seed treatments on why would we spend the money? And you can't even buy products anymore without a seed treatment. So the technology is where we're at today. And I think without it, myself personally, and again, I work in different areas outside of ag. Um, uh, if you, we didn't have those products, then then the environment would, would be degraded even more if they're degraded now. I think we would have less production. The food costs would go up. And so until we get those practices and people like Aaron who do the research, until they come forward with new approaches, and we're always trying things, new approaches uh, to control things, that if we can come up with a better solution, then obviously farmers will take it. So for me, it is part of the sustainable at this moment. Ten years from now, it may not be with ever advancing technologies. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would agree with that. I, I guess I would say yes. And, and one way I try to explain this to people in almost 30 years of doing this job, I've never made one recommendation that's ever increased a farmer's yield by one bushel. That's really not what I do. That's not what a herbicide does. 
A herbicide is simply applied to control other competing plant species. And these species are competing with the crop that we are intentionally sown in that area for the same resources. For example, the resources that a corn plant needs to uh, grow and reproduce are in many cases the exact same resources that weeds need to grow and reproduce. And so by using uh, tools like herbicides, we're essentially controlling the unwanted vegetation and allowing the crop to express its genetic yield potential. So I always remind folks that, you know, wheat scientists don't do anything to increase yields. That's where plant breeders come into play. That's what they do. So we're really using herbicides really as a yield, you know, something to protect the yield potential of the crop itself. Mm -hmm. And Tony, I would, I would agree with Fred and Aaron. Um, certainly pesticides are part of a sustainable food system. And um, when we think about, you know, the, the food affordability that's attached by having those higher yields that, that come from using modern tools, the fact that we're able to produce more food on, uh, on less acreage, which allows other uh, acreages that are less productive to be, in, you know, in, uh, you know, nature or whatever, certainly is part of a sustainable food system. I'll, I'll tell a little story about a farmer that uh, a friend of mine who decided to a few years ago to switch to organic production, not because he had, he thought it was interesting. And, uh, you know, the, the average person thinks that pesticides aren't used in organics, but of course they are. But he was telling me that his environmental footprint from going to conventional to organic probably didn't change. And in fact, it may have gone up when he switched to organic because he didn't have the tools available to him he had before. So he had to do extra tillage. He had to use different ways. So his, his fuel bill went through the roof while his pesticide bill went down, but he feels that his environmental footprint was, uh, was very similar. So the use of modern tools and modern technology is certainly a big part of a sustainable food system and supports that, that equity in the food system that allows all people, as many people around the world as possible to have access to healthy, healthy uh, safe food. And, uh, you know, it, it's better for the environment as we are allowed to leave areas that are uncultivated that may not be productive. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned the tillage piece and everything there, too. I mean, reducing tillage was one of the, the really big hallmark, mm -hmm. great things that happened when we, when we had herbicides that came into the market that, that could be sprayed over the top of crops. So uh, it certainly seems like, there's no one size fit all approach, I guess, is kind of the big big lesson here is organic has its place. Pesticides have their place. Everything works together uh, in a way that, that, you know, is demand driven by the consumer. So, so obviously if, if we, if people want organic products, we have a number of farmers that do it. I work with them. They're very successful. They make lots of money, which ultimately it's a different product that people want. I don't place any values good or bad on it. That's what they want. That's what we'll grow. That's what we'll sell. And so my, my whole, the whole point here is, I can do both and both of them be sustainable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Fred, I have one question for you that we actually got last week. Last week, we talked about seed treatments and uh, the science behind seed treatments. Yes. And we had a question that was, how does seed treatment dust off compare to foliar insecticides in terms of toxicity to pollinators? Okay. So there was, there were, and so the, the I'll re sort of rephrase it. So the question is, we have a number of, seed treatments that we put on uh, and so as we uh, plant our corn for example and then we accumulate this a lot of this let's call it dust and that dust then is is put out um, and so they were able to show some studies here by a very good researcher uh, that that was an issue that affected pollinators so again the whole point is that's the issue we have to deal with it and so we started looking at lots of different types of uh, treatments that would go on the seed that would allow us to, to keep the, basically to keep the dust down, just like you would at a grain storage facility. And so then the, then, so the question is, your question is, how does it relate to foliar? Well, most bees aren't out, bees are not going to be out there until things are actually blooming um, and those kind of things. So it, it's probably, uh, I guess more of an issue with the blowout, if I was thinking about it now, 
then it would be making a foliar application because these bees are not just visiting plants. They're going to plants that are flowering in some way or another. So I don't know if I answered the question or not, but it, it just shows that we, we found a problem. We tried to fix it. And, and we'll see where that goes in the future. That's something that EPA will be looking at, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a constant evolution of just more research, more figuring out what works, what doesn't, and what, what can be improved. So, all right, guys. Well, I unfortunately have to say we are at time um, and actually a little bit over. So thank you guys so much for your, your fantastic insights. Uh, for all of our viewers, expect a follow-up article uh, from me with, with great quotes from each of these experts. Um, thank you again to all of you who watched, and uh, I, I hope that, that you got a lot of value out of this, too. It was certainly a very interesting uh, conversation. So be sure to stay tuned next week as our host, Mark Zinkowitz, tackles the topic of indig indigenous influence in seed and plant breeding and how it can help us build a better industry. Uh, so talking diversity and talking about just what we can do to continue to bolster and make our seed industry stronger. So thank you all so much. Tune in next week at 12 Central. This is Sonia Begeman signing off.